This is the Facts of Life, where research-based knowledge from the failing consumer sciences is brought to you with life application. I'm your host, Amanda Harner. My guest today is food safety expert, Dr. Carla Schwann. And these are the facts on food safety and chronic disease. So today I have with me Dr. Carla Schwann. Um, She is from the University of Georgia in Athens, and she is a food safety specialist for the University of Georgia Extension. Thank you for joining us today. And um, tell me a little bit about what your background is, what your um, PhD is in, uh, so that our viewers have a little bit more of an understanding of where we're coming from. Yeah, so by training, um, I'm a food scientist and I'm originally from Brazil, so I did my bachelor's degree uh, back in Brazil. Uh, and I had the opportunity to come to the US to do um, an internship in a program that was called Science Without Borders. So that allowed me to learn um, some of the technologies and even you know culturally and all of that in the US for one year and all the techniques that were utilized in food science, specifically food safety in the US, which was, um, I cannot even capture how much that benefited me. Mm-hmm. So once I was done with that program, I went back to Brazil, graduated with my bachelor's degree in food science and technology. And then I had the opportunity to come back and do my master's degree. Uh, at Kansas State University looking at uh, shiga toxin producing E. coli in beef products. Okay, say that slowly one Sorry. more time because I have a hard time catching that and I've heard you say it before, but I, there are going to be other people who, all right, really slow. Yes, okay, really slow. So I, my master's degrees, uh, degree was focused on um, shiga toxin producing E. coli. Shiga toxin producing E. coli. It's a mouthful. It is a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> so for short, we can we often refer to as STEC, like S T E C. S T E C. Okay. Yeah, S T E C. Um, and so I was looking at that bacteria um, and contamination in beef products and how we could develop interventions to reduce. Essex in beef. That was my master's degree and okay. then my PhD I had the opportunity to do a lot of um, work in developing countries so I had a chance to work in Cambodia, mm. um, Ethiopia, Bangladesh, uh, Paraguay, um, different projects but they were all focused on food safety and some of them had milk involved, some of them had produce involved, some of them had food contact surfaces, non-food contact mm, surfaces, all, all the things that you can imagine and all where bacteria can live. Um, so we looked at different things there, trying to identify the baseline for some countries, what was um, the level of contamination, so we know how much is there, so we know uh, where to start. Uh, in the U.S., that's very well developed already, and so yeah. it's it's a little bit the reality is a little bit different, but um, in de- in overseas location, right? Yeah. Right. So, was there a favorite project out of your PhD projects? Um, they were all really good, but I think the one that I interacted the most, like culturally, and had a chance to spend more time, and so that way I learned more, and I'm a little bit biased that way because mm-hmm. I had just more time with. With that country and that project was Cambodia. Interesting. So I lived in Cambodia. I went back and forth multiple times, but I had a chance to live there over the summer. Okay. To conduct research and then uh, connect with um, with our local students and uh, faculty and just consumers in general, going to the markets. And so that was a fun experience, and I even learned a few words in Khmer. So <laughs> nice. Okay. So what? Do you still remember your words in Kamai? So, Akuncharan. Akuncharan. That's thank you. Thank you. Um, nice. Um, Sucks a boy, I think is one. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> You're not sure. Okay, well, maybe we'll, we'll stop there. there. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. So since we've digressed a little bit, just for fun, what is the most spontaneous thing you've ever done? Yeah. So that's a great question, like leading our conversation. Um, so what I'm very much, I like to organize, you know, way in advance. I, I, I need to know all the details and everything. That's how I operate. Mm-hmm. 
And when I was living in Cambodia, there was a weekend that I was not working. And I said, you know what? I'm, I have two days here that I'm not working. I could really explore beautiful Cambodia, right? Mm -hmm. So I just found this um, uh, bus online that would take me to rural Cambodia to the temples in Angkor Wat. And I decided to go. So mm -hmm. it was not m my profile at all because I'm very predictable. But that week, I was just, I don't know. It was just... I felt right, and so I took a bus seven hours later. I was in Angkor Wat. I didn't speak Khmer, and everybody was like, what are you doing in this bus, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. So it was interesting, and uh, now looking back, um, I think it was very very um, good for me to have done that. Um, yeah. And learned a lot about the culture and seeing beautiful um, sights and just enriching even more the culture that I was learning when I was there so that very was very nice yeah <laughs> yeah that's cool some for some of us spontaneous looks um like less planning <laughs> yeah, <I do. laughs> and for, for some of us spontaneous <laughs> looks like um doing very crazy things right. so <laughs> right. uh, yeah, that's true <laughs> so you have a very personal reason that led you to be interested in food safety science, right? Yeah. Can you share that with us? Yes, for sure. So um, when I was a kid, um, and I, I couldn't say that that's the only reason why it led me to do food science and food okay. safety, but it's one of the reasons that I'm like, yeah, this, this feels right, and I think I can help people with my experience and sharing that, raising mm -hmm. awareness of that. So when I was a kid, um, I often would go with my dad to extension uh, events because my dad was an extension person, and he, uh, when I had vacation, because summertime in Brazil is the opposite as here, right? We have right. The, it's like South opposite. America, the, under the equator, <laughs> right. is, it's like summer now or coming yes. out of summer now right yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> exactly so i would be in vacation from december till like end of february it was like long period of vacation but my dad would still go and do programs and stuff like that so he would take me with him mm -hmm. to all those different field days and often we would stop at you know um, restaurants on the side of the road to eat and whatnot and it wasn't different that day we went to a program and we stopped to eat a burger and when we, the burgers in Brazil are very big, so we shared one. My dad shared ate half and I ate half. Mm -hmm. And I was a kid, I think I was 11, 12 years old. And he ate half, I ate half. You know, several hours later, I started having some symptoms and I had stomach ache, I was vomiting, I had diarrhea, I was feeling really terrible. And mm -hmm. people were like, oh, you just have a stomach bug, right? And it didn't go away. So next day I was even worse and worse and worse. Oh, and wow. then my parents took me to the hostel and they said, oh, she just had a stomach bug, stomach bug. Send me back home with some fluids and stuff to rehydrate, but I wouldn't get better. Mm. Um, and then it got to a point where I was uh, literally passing out because I was so weak, I couldn't hold anything in my stomach. And they took me to a bigger hospital. They said, oh, we don't know what to do with her anymore, so let's take her to the next city. Mm -hmm. Because I live in a very, I come from a very, very tiny, 3,000 people. You can yeah, imagine. that's pretty small. <laughs> so they took me to the next city, and they did a bunch of tests and exams and collect samples and everything. And they realized through the test that I had Shiga toxin producing E. coli. Estec. Estec. Yes. <laughs> and they said, oh, what do we do? And it was progressing so quickly that because it took a long time for them to figure out what it was, you imagine resources and, you know, um, just the availability of, of supplies to do those testings um, just took forever to mm -hmm. get that result back. And so by the time they knew what I had, it was maybe 15, 20 days already. Mm -hmm. And I was super, super sick. And they put me on dialysis, my kidneys were shutting down and they said, we should treat her with antibiotics because that's the only way she will probably survive because I was very close to, to dying at that point. Right. And so they gave me antibiotics and yay, here I am. Sometimes depending, um, on what type of, of, of strain you have, 
uh, and if the, the bacteria is resistant to antibiotics or sometimes if the bacteria sees the antibiotic as a threat, it can produce even more toxin and then you can die from it. So wow. doctors really, they would make that decision um, last case scenario, I would say. Mm-hmm. Usually it's not common for, for them to use antibiotics in this case because the bacteria could produce more toxin and then you die from the toxin and the antibiotic is not going to save you. But in my case, it saved me. So here I am. Yes. And then, you know, after that month, I, I got better and better and better. But of course, my digestive system has never been the same since then. Mm-hmm. And then you fast forward to, I was 28 at the time. Um, so f- six, yeah, six years uh, ago, mm-hmm. I was um, diagnosed with Crohn's disease, uh, and interestingly enough, I have had uh, an episode of uh, gastroenteritis right when I was a kid. Mm. And so, oftentimes we talk about food safety as uh, the immediate symptoms and immediate outcomes that you see, like fever, diarrhea, vomiting, right. uh, dehydration, all that stuff. Uh, but we also mention and we talk about the long-term effects of foodborne illness right. that are really hard to track because how do you even know? You know, like years have passed and how you can track and pin that down to, oh, it was that event. Mm-hmm. And even to this day, uh, research um, is being conducted, but we have a better idea that some of those triggers can be, some of those uh, chronic disease can be triggered by um, bacteria that if you had a foodborne illness in the past could be trigger your immune system and then lead to a chronic disease which in my case Crohn's disease right so so um something that I've shared with you before that um I also want to share with the audience is one of the things that I really like about your story um and I think as humans we can be very attracted to stories like yours partly because um there's a real piece of optimism in your story. And it's not the optimism that you survived this because in reality, this was a very serious situation when it happened, you could have died. Yeah. Um, But the optimism that I'm talking about is there is science that talks about how um, it's, it's important to build resilience and it's important both for our health, our mental health, our physical health. And um, so I just really like about your story that it has something that was really negative has led to something very positive in your life, but not just your own life. It also has had a positive effect on other communities um, and other people. So can you talk a little bit about how um, your research, your work and kind of partly because it evolved out of this experience, how that has really had an impact on uh, communities in particular, or even just individuals. Yeah, so one of the things that I really like to think about this when I reflect back on everything that I went through as a kid, not even realizing what was going on, and now as a professional, that foodborne illness, uh, for the most part, are preventable. Mm. And that is just, if you think about it, it's like, let us sink. They are preventable. Yeah. If if there was something that was done back when that person was preparing that burger, um, was cooking it to the right temperature, if when that ground beef was, um, when that animal was being slaughtered, if practices were followed, there were so many steps that that could have been prevented and it was not. Mm-hmm. And so that is really, I guess, my mode, that knowing and reminding myself that most times we can prevent foodborne illness and because I work with consumer food safety educating the public and um, helping them with you know easy steps of things that they could do to prevent certain things Mm -hmm. that's what I do so my research focus on consumer food safety and harmful preservation and so anything that people would do at home um, is of my interest and so if I can help them to either by doing research in the lab of something that we don't know. Mm -hmm. For example, just to give an example, uh, there has been a huge demand and need for 
kombucha. People wanted to do kombucha at home. Right. And so, and if you don't do kombucha properly, if you don't make it properly. It can be very dangerous. It can be very dangerous. <laughs> yes. And if it's contaminated and you consume it, you could get sick. And so that was a need. And so what do we do? We went back to the lab, we conduct trials and we did research looking at survivability of different organisms or bacteria mm -hmm. and how we could then develop that recipe, looking at those variables to make a recipe that is safe for consumers. So now you mm -hmm. have that recipe, of course, all that research side that doesn't always interest the consumer, but right. we can translate that into a recipe then that can be used back, you know, give it back to the community and then they can use and have a safe recipe for kombucha. So that's right. just an example of how... That's a great example. <laughs> I mean, I think one of the other things that working for Extension, I know is part of your work um, is things like serve safe, um, where that directly affects the consumer, right? Because we go in and we train people who are working in the food industry make sure that they understand the precautions and the steps that need to be taken. Um, you train us as professionals to do that. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then there's other things too, like um, our So Easy to Preserve book, where that um, people who are interested in canning, which there's a huge uprising in that these days, um, a, very much an interest in growing your own vegetables and then um, if you don't use all of them being able to then take that and preserve it but people don't always realize that that can be if it's not done properly it can be very very dangerous right, right. so um yeah no i like that <laughs> <laughs> and that's the whole point of doing these things is to say like this is how it relates to you and this is why you should care about it yes and i think knowing that and just being grateful, I think that's another part of, if you're grateful for what you have and you have a perspective of, you know, what it could be and paying that forward, because I had a really great support, uh, network of support uh, at that time. And then knowing, you know, being in the US and having access to great doctors to, you know, all the fancy exams that you need to do mm -hmm. and all the, the great education, um, just knowing that that's available and being grateful for everything, um, on that front as well, and then paying it forward, I think really helps me to understand that maybe somebody that will hear uh, my story or will know a tip on food safety that would do it differently, they would use a thermometer to measure a burger uh, yeah. patty, um, maybe that would prevent somebody from getting sick. And that is what really, I guess, motivates me to Pay yeah, it forward. and to yes. keep going <laughs> yeah. on the days when being a professor is hard. Yes, <laughs> yes you're right. Yes. <laughs> and when there's all the demands <laughs> of <laughs> all the phone calls for food preservation, right. and yeah, yeah. so <laughs> preventing botulism, <laughs> yeah. Bo botulism. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I actually can you share this um, statistic about um, botulism that. I don't think a lot of people realize, I think people understand that botulism is serious, but they don't necessarily know how serious botulism is. Yeah. So what is the percentage of death typically when somebody contracts? So the, the, there is, there's botulism that can come from you know food and then there's infant botulism and then there's wound botulism too. Mm -hmm. So when you look at um, the statistics for it, for food, it's not as high as, as you would see as compared to Salmonella or E. coli. Mm -hmm. um, but when you look at the, so the incidence rate is not as high, but the death rate is really high. So it's really um, people that contract botulism, mm -hmm. they rarely survive. And when they do survive, they have serious consequences and they would need physical therapy for a long time because their nerves and you know everything has been paralyzed. Yeah. So. The, the death uh, rate is really high and so of course we want to prevent even from getting to that point and producing a toxin. And botulism tends to be one that we get very concerned about with canning, correct? Yes, yes. Botulism, and sometimes yes. with honey? So honey for infants, uh, mm -hmm. kids smaller than 12 months of age, um, they don't have their um, intestinal tract yet developed fully and their immune system and so if they consume spores, which could be present in honey, 
the spore can eclode and the bacteria can then um, survive and produce toxin in the stomach because our stomach is um, one of the requirements for botulism to grow is not having oxygen in our stomach. Mm. It is an anaerobic environment allowing that to happen. And so mm. kids don't have all that microflora developed yet. And so Clostridium don't have to fight with other bacteria. So it's easier for Clostridium to grow and produce a toxin in kids smaller than 12 months of age. And yeah. for adults, we, we probably consume... Um, products and you know vegetables or honey or things that might have spores but because we are we have a um, fully developed immune system and we have more bacteria in our gut mm -hmm. it really doesn't allow clostridium to grow and, and produce a toxin so yeah, yeah. interesting yeah <laughs> um so let's pivot back for a second and talk a little bit more about specifics with food safety and chronic disease so in your life personally, Crohn's disease is something that um, developed in your, you said your late 20s, yeah, right? Yeah. And um, there's the possibility that that's connected with your experience that you had as a child. And can you explain a little bit about Crohn's disease to the audience? Because I think people have heard about it, but there's a lot of people who don't really know what Crohn's disease is. Yeah, so Crohn's disease is an autoimmune disorder, which basically your body is constantly fighting with your own body. Um, your immune system is triggering a mechanism, a defense on something that is not really there, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So mm -hmm. when we have an infection with bacteria, let's say, uh, our immune system is going to deploy different mechanisms to uh, eliminates that bacteria so we don't get sick mm -hmm. and that's a, like a real trigger with Crohn's disease um, it's an autoimmune disorder that your immune system is constantly triggering deploying uh, mechanisms to fight something in your body even though it's not really even there. though it's not really there yes and in this case it can vary so Crohn's disease can happen anywhere in your um, GI tract so your gastrointestinal tract track. Um, and so inflammation happens and when you have an inflammation that is happening in your body, especially in your intestines, uh, you absorb less nutrients um, because when you have something that is inflaming and is healing, you build that scar tissue inside your intestine. Mm. And so um, just to give you an idea, in my case, until we, we knew, the doctors knew I had Crohn's disease and I could find a treatment that worked for me, it took a long time. And so I already have 50% of my intestine is um, reduced uh, in, the, in the diameter because wow. of stack scar tissue. And so I'm not able to absorb as much, you know, as many nutrients as I would if I didn't have this. Right. So a lot of times when people have um, Crohn's disease for a long time and it's not treated, sometimes they have to remove part of the intestine because that it's is so severe. So severe that it has to be removed, and you know, the, you know, it, it, it can, it can be life threatening if you don't mm -hmm. have access to medication and treatment. Yeah. So, yeah. In in my case, I I receive infusions every six weeks to mm -hmm. keep my immune system quiet. So I like to say to say that it's shutting down. Not really, but you know, lay terms, it's shutting down my immune system. Um, to allow me to have a life that I can function and I can work and I can go out. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I'm constantly sick. And when mm -hmm. I say constantly sick, having symptoms as a lot of pain, uh, diarrhea, blood diarrhea. Uh, I know it's really hard and nasty to talk yeah, about those things. And people but they're like, reality. They're reality. And people that go mm -hmm. through this, sometimes they feel ashamed to go and ask for help because nobody wants to go and tell your friend, oh, I'm having this. And, I don't know what to do or even going to the doctor and talking about this is hard mm -hmm. I was ashamed when I didn't know what to do mm -hmm. back then too but I think if if we talk about it and people know and it, it's it's we are breaking that cycle cycle of oh I'm, I'm ashamed of it mm -hmm. maybe more people can get help sooner and mm -hmm. feel better sooner and just you know we can talk about it more more easily because the sooner that you deal with it the in theory hopefully there would be less scarring You're right and um that way it doesn't 
affect as drastically your body's ability to digest the nutrients and yeah. use it absorb to their body's yeah. benefit. Yes, absorb nutrients. Yes. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> no, you're, you're yeah. 100% correct in that. So, yeah. yeah. And that affects your level of energy, how much, you know, you're going to be, I guess, um, when you wake up, you know, and, and mm -hmm. I know that for me, because of that, I have to do, I have to re um, replenish vitamin D, for example, that's a big mm. thing. Things like that. I know my doctor knows what to look for when I do blood exams and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so they know what do I need to supplement in order to have good energy so I can work and I can exercise and I can, you know, just have, have a, a productive a, life. A productive life, yes. And a satisfying life. Yeah, right? and not always being afraid of going stepping out of the door and being sick and not knowing what to What's do. What's going to happen. Exactly. Right. So it's, it affects our mental health too because I had a lot of support and I'm very thankful for that. Mm -hmm. But I know of people who have reached out to me um, talking about, oh, I don't want to go out anymore. Um, you know, ref mm. refusing all my friends and invites to do stuff because I'm afraid I'm going to go out to a restaurant and maybe the bathroom is not clean or maybe I'm going to get sick and then people are not going to understand because nobody knows about this. And so it mm. really starts affecting your mental health too. So I think the more that we talk about and raise awareness, um, you know, and the preventing, better. hopefully, in the front end from food safety perspective, that would be yeah, ideal. Right. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Like, I think um, one of the things that I'm really passionate about um, in terms of public health and chronic disease prevention and nutrition in particular is um, that really, I mean, we are a whole person. <laughs> like, they, it, we don't function in a vacuum. Um, our environment affects us, uh, things that are going on in our bodies affect us, things that are going on in our relationships affect us, and um, we're complicated beings. Yeah. So um, I appreciate that you also brought out that, which we see with other chronic illnesses too, right? That it can affect your mental health. And um, that is on top of all the other reasons to not want to get a chronic disease and to prevent it or to manage chronic disease while it is important to recognize that, you know, preventing it at the front end really is important. Yeah. Whether it is um, preventing a chronic disease that you can get through um, a, a horrible strand of E. coli, right. <laughs> or <laughs> whether it's something that is diabetes or, or um, cardiovascular disease right. or any of the other chronic diseases that we tend to be concerned about in public health. So let's come back around for a second because we're pretty much almost out of time. And before we kind of give some resources for the audience and direct them to good locations to look up information about food safety, um, let's talk a little bit about we, we've kind of talked about some of the scary realities <laughs> of food safety. Um, but I mean, I think it's important to remember that, especially in the United States, we are very fortunate to have a lot of things in place um, and a lot of things that are set up to protect us, um, whether we're totally aware of that or not. So. Would you like to share a little bit about what that looks like in the U.S.? Yes, yes. As, as you said, on a positive note, um, foodborne illness are preventable. So it's that's the first thing I want to mention again. And um, we have amazing public health agencies and, and federal agencies in the U.S. that really take care on the back end that sometimes is the behind the scenes that we mm. don't see uh, many times. So um, looking at systems and looking at where contamination can be coming in, how we can um, implement interventions to reduce that or Im eliminate that, or even from the back end, not having it going into the food chain in the first place. So right. implementing regulations, implementing steps, um, helping food companies to accomplish that, implementing uh, plans, food safety plans to to prevent or eliminate that hazard, uh, and you could net, that could come in several different ways, not only bacteria but other things too. So we have 
so much going on that, uh, for example, USDA and FDA regulate um, in our food supply and they provide regulations, they provide guidance to minimize those risks. So those are all great things and that's why we don't see as much foodborne illness as we could right. if we didn't have them in place. And then CDC is monitoring all of that and knowing somebody got sick here, somebody got sick there, mm -hmm. is triggering their system, they are looking and they're cross-referencing the genome of bacteria to know maybe if there's an outbreak happening so they can stop it very early on so no more uh, more people, you know, avoiding more people from getting sick. Right, and there's certain so, protocols, right, for yeah. de depending on what the outbreak is. So like if it's a more serious version of E. coli, there's going to be a different protocol that takes place versus if botulism shows up somewhere, yes. that's a whole other protocol that might happen even faster because right. we talked about how um, botulism has a pretty high death rate, even though it yes. doesn't happen very often. Very often, exactly. And there's, they have uh, plans in place for even like allergens, if we have an outbreak with not an outbreak, but a recall with food mm. product with allergens, they, they're going to have a different approach for that. So all those are they're great things to remember right. that we have a very safe food supply in the U.S. And those are great things to to know and not be scared because right. we know there's people that are taking care of that. And we have researchers all, all around the U.S. doing research to improve some of those um detection methods or interventions to reduce contamination or even eliminate contamination so right and even to control and manage exactly. chronic disease exactly. so um so with all of that said there is and part of the point of this is to say there is a responsibility on the consumer despite everyone's best efforts it it doesn't matter there's still outbreaks of different things um, contaminants can still get into food, um, and that can happen through a variety of ways. So what can the consumer do? What do we communicate to the consumer as professionals um, that they can take the step themselves? Yeah, so for consumers, I, I like to talk about four, four simple steps that you can take to prevent uh, foodborne illness at home mm -hmm. or, you know, um, in your, your workplace or whatever you might be doing. Um, the first one is uh, clean. First one is clean. Clean. So <laughs> wash your hands frequently. How often? Long? For 20 seconds. 20 seconds. And clean surfaces. So I yes. talked earlier about food contact surfaces. Those are really important too. So clean the surfaces where you're preparing or handling food. So that's the first one, clean. The second one is separate. So separate raw meats from everything else mm -hmm. because raw meats can contain bacteria and we don't wanna let that contamination spread if we don't separate um, raw meats from all the foods or ready to eat foods that are ready to be consumed. Right. So clean, co um, separate. The third one, I was getting ahead of myself, is cook. So food needs to be cooked uh, to uh, the appropriate internal temperature. Mm -hmm. And USDA uh, has great guidelines on that, on different foods and how, what, what temperature and sometimes for how many seconds. So um, maybe we can include that as resources at the end of the yes. video. Yes, and we'll include it in the show description and notes and everything. Perfect. So that was the third one, so cook. Yeah. And the fourth one is chill. So refrigerate promptly. So when you get home from supermarket, make sure that if you need to clean something in the surface, clean it, but immediately put it in the refrigerator or when you're cooking as well, refrigerate promptly. So those are the four ways. Let's recap them. Recap. Clean. Clean. Separate. Separate. Cook. cook and chill chill yes. <laughs> got it yay <laughs> all right thank you so much dr carla schwann um thank it you. was such a pleasure to be able to interview you i appreciate your time and you. enjoy having you as one of my colleagues and yeah. um yeah so we mentioned uh, a couple of government resources so the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture or the USDA mm -hmm. is a good resource for food safety information. You can check out their website and we'll provide the information. And then in addition, um, the FDA or the Federal, uh, Federal Department, Department of Drug Administration. Administration. <laughs> 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 it could be the It's too many. Too many acronyms. 
I guess. Yeah. Too many acronyms. <laughs> and I'm probably going to leave that in there just for fun. <laughs> Federal <laughs> Drug <laughs> Administration is the other government entity that handles um, things with our food safety, and they also have a lot of good information on their website. Um, so we will provide the links for those, but you can also reach out to your extension. So in Georgia, we have the extension through the University of Georgia, but we also have Fort Valley Extension. Um, and you can check out either of those web pages. Again, we will put that information in the description. And if you happen to live somewhere else in the United States or possibly even overseas, you can check out extension websites um, of the land grant universities throughout the country. Thank you for your time again. And Thank you for having me. Yeah. Was, I had so much fun Good. connecting with you and sharing some, having this uh, conversation about important topics that sometimes they're hard to talk about. Yeah. Uh, but I appreciate the invitation. And yeah, thank, you. thank you so much for, for having me. And I appreciate you as a colleague as well. And oh, thank you. All the great things we're going to do together. Yes, yeah. <laughs> me too. <laughs> Research-based resources referenced in and related to this episode of Facts of Life can be found in the episode notes and description information. The views and thoughts expressed in this video podcast are the speaker's own and do not necessarily represent the views, thoughts, and opinions of the University of Georgia or the guest's organizations and or employers. The material and information presented here is for general information purposes only. The University of Georgia name, as well as those of guest organizations, and all forms and abbreviations are the property of its owner and its use does not imply endorsement of or opposition to any specific organization, product, or service. These are the facts of life. Thanks for joining us. Check out our website at monroefacts.extension.uga.edu. That's Monroe, F-A-C-S, dot extension, dot U-G-A, dot E-D-U.